Uh, baik Bapak Ibu, kita akan mulai acara kita pagi ini. Pastiin semuanya nggak ada yang itu ya. Jakarta, kota metropolitan dengan berbagai tantangan yang dihadapi, membuat inovasi-inovasi untuk mengatasi nah, permasalahan melalui serangkaian kebijakan publik yang disusun sehingga dapat menjadi kota percontohan bagi kota-kota lainnya untuk dapat belajar dari Jakarta. Jakarta Public Policy Center merupakan sebuah wadah untuk pengembangan kompetensi dan kebijakan publik di bawah badan kota metropolitan dengan berbagai tantangan yang dihadapi di Jakarta. Jakarta Public Policy Center untuk DKI Jakarta melalui penyelenggaraan pengembangan kompetensi, knowledge management, dan fasilitas studi banding terkait informasi pengelolaan kebijakan publik di pemerintah Provinsi DKI Jakarta agar kebijakan publik tersebut menjadi konsisten dan tepat sasaran. Dalam rangka pengembangan kompetensi dan pengelolaan kebijakan publik, Jakarta Public Policy Center memberikan fasilitasi di antaranya mencakup pengembangan kompetensi teknis, pengembangan kompetensi pemerintahan dan sosial kultural, pengembangan kompetensi teknis strategis melalui public training, seminar urban regeneration, fasilitas studi banding dan best practice, serta kerjasama internasional dengan lembaga atau institusi luar negeri dalam rangka pengembangan kompetensi baik ASN maupun non-ASN. Jakarta Public Policy Center untuk Jakarta Tangguh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Kiora, good morning from Jakarta and good afternoon in Wellington, New Zealand. Ladies and gentlemen, our audience, welcome to Human Resources Development Board of Jakarta Capital City Government webinar session today, Wednesday, the 10 February 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the topic today. Our topic is Learning from Friends, International Collaboration in Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. And I'm very happy to inform to all of you that the head of Human Resources Development Board of Jakarta Capital City Government The Honorable Madam Maria Kiptia is already with us right now. And I'm also honored to welcome to our honorable guest speakers for today. We start from Deputy Governor for Populations and Settlement Control of Jakarta, Madam Suharti. Good morning, Madam. And Regulatory Reform Attache, uh, British Embassy Jakarta, Miss Zoe Dayan. Good morning. Deputy Head of School and Associate Professor in School of the Government, Terhingga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington, Mr. Dr. Carl Lovren. Good morning. And also, I would like to introduce our moderator from the Policy Manager at Governor's Delivery Unit of Jakarta, Ms. Artricia Rashid. Distinguished guest audience, ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I would like to, in to invite the Head of Human Resources Development Board of Jakarta Capital City Government for the opening remark to Madam Maria Kiptia. The time is yours. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, selamat pagi, salam sejahtera buat kita semua. Yang terhormat para narasumber, Ibu Suharti, Deputi Gubernur Bidang Pengendalian Penduduk dan Permukiman Provinsi DKI Jakarta, Dr. Carl Lovren, Deputy Head of School and Associate Professor in School of Government, T. Herenga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Good afternoon, Mr. Carl. 
Miss Ju Dayan, Regulatory Reform at uh, British Embassy Jakarta. Good morning, Miss Ju Dayan. Moderator kita pagi hari ini, Miss Atricia Rashid, Policy Manager Tim Gubernur untuk Percepatan Provinsi uh, Percepatan Pembangunan Provinsi DKI Jakarta. Pada yang uh, terhormat. Kepala Badan Pengembangan Sumber Daya Manusia Kementerian Dalam Negeri Republik Indonesia atau yang mewakili, Kepala Lembaga Administrasi Negara Republik Indonesia atau yang mewakili, Kepala Pusat Pengembangan Sumber Daya Manusia Kementerian Dalam Negeri Regional Bandung atau yang mewakili, para pejabat di lingkungan pemerintah provinsi DKI Jakarta, para kepala badan pengembangan sumber daya manusia di seluruh Indonesia atau yang mewakili, para peserta seminar virtual hadirin dan undangan yang berbahagia. Marilah kita panjatkan puji syukur kehadirat Allah Subhanahu wa taala, Tuhan yang Maha Kuasa atas rahmatnya kita dapat melaksanakan seminar virtual dengan tema Learning from Friends International Collaboration in Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. Seminar virtual ini menjadi momentum yang tepat bagi pemerintah Provinsi DKI Jakarta dan masyarakat luas untuk memperoleh pembelajaran yang lebih komprehensif serta untuk dapat mengadopsi inisiatif dari beberapa negara dalam penanganan pandemi COVID-19. Bapak Ibu yang berbahagia, seminar virtual ini merupakan kegiatan Jakarta Public Policy Center, salah satu unit pelaksana teknis Badan Pengembangan Sumber Daya Manusia Pemerintah Provinsi DKI Jakarta yang dibentuk pada akhir tahun 2019. Di mana salah satu tugas dari Jakarta Public Policy Center ini adalah memberikan informasi apa-apa yang sudah, sedang, dan akan pemerintah Provinsi DKI lakukan. Di samping itu juga Jakarta Public Policy Center ini melaksanakan sharing knowledge baik dari negara-negara sahabat maupun lembaga-lembaga internasional untuk memberikan ilmu dan pengalaman pengalamannya yang bermanfaat. Untuk itulah seminar pada pagi hari ini kita selenggarakan sebagai diskusi dan belajar dari best practice inovasi kebijakan publik yang berhasil diterapkan beberapa negara. Dalam hal ini negara Inggris dan New Zealand. <tuh> Bapak Ibu yang kami muliakan, peserta yang sudah bergabung dalam acara ini sebanyak lebih dari 300 orang berasal dari perwakilan BPSDM Kementerian Dalam Negeri, perwakilan Lembaga Administrasi Negara Republik Indonesia, perwakilan PPSDM Regional Bandung, perwakilan SKPD dan UKPD di lingkungan pemerintah Provinsi DKI Jakarta, perwakilan BPSDM seluruh Indonesia, para akademisi dan perwakilan Universitas Indonesia, Universitas Paramadina, Universitas Budi Luhur, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Swiss Germany University, perwakilan asosiasi rumah sakit daerah seluruh Indonesia, perwakilan asosiasi rumah sakit swasta Indonesia dan masyarakat umum. Acara ini akan berlangsung lebih kurang sampai dengan pukul 11 siang nanti. Acara ini pun di siarkan secara live streaming melalui kanal YouTube BPSDM Provinsi DKI Jakarta. Adapun bentuk kegiatan seminar virtual kita pagi hari ini adalah berupa ceramah dari narasumber, tanya jawab, dan pengisian kuesioner. Para narasumber dan hadirin yang saya banggakan, saya berharap seminar virtual ini menjadi wadah yang efektif dalam mendapatkan masukan-masukan yang dapat diadopsi 
dalam penanganan pandemi COVID-19 ke depan. Bukan hanya pada pendekatan epidemiologi, tapi juga pada aspek-aspek lainnya. Kepada para narasumber, saya ucapkan terima kasih banyak dan apresiasi yang setinggi-tingginya karena berkenan untuk membagi ilmu dan pengalamannya kepada kita semua. Kepada para peserta, saya berharap dapat mengikuti acara seminar ini dengan baik sehingga dapat mengambil manfaat yang optimal. Akhirnya, dengan mengucapkan Bismillahirrohmanirrohim, Seminar Virtual Learning from Friends International Collaboration in Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic saya nyatakan dibuka. Selamat mengikuti seminar virtual ini. Semoga Allah Subhanahu wa taala, Tuhan yang Maha Kuasa, memberikan bimbingan dan ridhonya kepada kita semua. Amin, amin, amin ya robbal alamin. Terima kasih. Billahi taufik wal hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Madam Maria Kiptia, for the opening remark. Distinguished guests, our audience, ladies and gentlemen, for your information, you could access our webinar by visiting our YouTube channel at BPSDM DKI Jakarta. And moreover, we are welcoming to you to give questions about discussions through Q&A button on your Zoom screen, or you can comment in our YouTube platform uh, channel. And also, we provide uh, you uh, the interpreter options to accommodation to accommodate Bahasa Indonesia to English or vice versa where needed. And I would like to ask to you to stand by at the end of this uh, webinar session for a short evaluation form that provided by committee. Bapak Ibu yang kami hormati, perlu kami informasikan bahwa acara ini juga kami siarkan secara langsung melalui YouTube channel kami di BPSDM DKI Jakarta. Dan juga kami menyediakan uh, fasilitas penterjemah dalam aplikasi Zoom Bapak Ibu di sudut bawah bagian kanan ada tombol interpretation. Bapak Ibu tinggal mengklik saja jika ingin menggunakan fasilitas penterjemah bahasa dari bahasa Inggris ke bahasa Indonesia. Dan kami mohon untuk Bapak Ibu agar tetap standby hingga akhir acara dikarenakan akan ada penilaian evaluasi kegiatan hari ini secara online di mana nanti akan muncul enam penilaian dan Bapak Ibu hanya memilih tidak setuju, setuju atau sangat setuju. Baiklah, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let's start our webinar today with the time learning from France, international collaboration in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which will be moderated by Ms. Artricia Rashid, the, the policy manager at Governor's Unit Delivery at Jakarta. To Ms. Artricia, time is yours. Thank you so much, Mas Rudy. Nice to meet you again. And terima kasih banyak, Ibu Maria, for the warm greeting and introduction. So uh, I think it is very interesting to note that when a month ago I was uh, invited to be the moderator for this webinar, the theme or the title was in learning from friends. It was learning from partners. And I was just notified about a day or two days ago, I think, that the Jakarta Public Policy Center had changed the theme. And I think it couldn't be more fitting, learning from friends, than it is today, right? As we see the number of active cases or the number of total cases climbing in, in the whole world, uh, now we're seeing 107 million of COVID cases, and there are more than 2 million deaths. So I think just as a brief introduction, uh, how important is this webinar is because this is truly a global problem. We are here hand in hand, not only as partners, but moreover as friends. So without further ado, as Ibu Maria had introduced our guest speakers, I would like to just briefly uh, share with you all in the YouTube as well in our, uh, in our Zoom, uh, their backgrounds. So our first speaker is Ms. Zoe Dan, who is the regulatory reform as well as health attaché at the British Embassy in Jakarta. Ms. Dan's professional experience uh, include a decade in pharma manufacturing, as well as a career as a civil servant in the UK DTI or UK Department for Trade and Industry. Ms. Dan focuses on innovation in both the uh, public and private sector, and in 2014, she started uh, a startup supporting healthcare businesses in Southeast England. Hello, Ms. Dayan. Ms. Dayan is joining us from Jakarta. Our second speaker is Dr. Carl Lofgren. 
He is the deputy head of school and associate professor at the New Zealand's Victoria University of Wellington School of Government. Previously, Dr. Lofgren had taught at various departments uh, in Denmark as well as Sweden, and he focuses on public administration, political science, as well as the use of information uh, systems and technology. Dr. Lofgren had been involved as primary investigator for a Nordic research network, as well as uh, a lead in Europe scientific as well as technology corporations. Hello, uh, Dr. Lofgren, he's joining us from New Zealand. Hi. <laughs> Hi. And our last speaker is, uh, never the least, Dr. Suharti Sutar, uh, my partner in a lot of webinars. I hope you are not bored of me <laughs> and our audience. I hope you're still excited to be seeing us. Dr. Suharti Sutar is the city's deputy governor for population and settlement control, as well as the acting assistant for people's welfare. She received her doctorate in demographic studies from the ANU or Australian National University. And she will be our last speaker because she will tie in all the conversations and share Jakarta's collaborative response for the pandemic. So without further ado, I would hand over to Ms. Zoe Dan, who would share with us about uh, UK's very interesting makeshift structures, how the UK could set up uh, the Nightingale Hospital, I think it was ready in just nine days with the help of a lot of sol soldiers. I think it took hundreds of soldiers to create that space. Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested to hear that, especially as Jakarta still struggles with creating more spaces for our quarantine as well as hospitalization um, um, purposes. So Ms. Zoe Dayan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm very honoured to be asked to speak. Um, just before I start, I would say that in the UK, we really do believe in learning from others and in sharing our own experiences, uh, both good and bad. So I will try to be honest about what we have tried that is working and where we still have difficulties. Um, and that learning is really important, even during you, know, e even in the middle of dealing with something. And it helps us uh, continue to deal with the challenge and to th start to think about how we might be in the future, how we can prepare ourselves and respond better uh, to, to future challenges. So thank you very much. I will say a little, I, I will try to share my screen if I may. I hope you can see this. I am not seeing it yet. Uh, maybe our friends from the JPPC could. We could see it. Okay. I will stop then and, and yeah. Okay. Thank you. So thank you very much. I will. I will concentrate this morning on how we have tried to create more capacity in our healthcare system um, to, to, to help us cope with the pandemic, with COVID-19. Um, and it's been a mixture of physical and process innovations. Uh, some remarkable, uh, we have created a huge amount of additional space for caring for people. Some has worked better than others. Um, but I will start, as Buatricia said, talking about the physical space that, that we have managed to make available. So this, you have to imagine 2019 and 2012, in fact, one of these before the Olympics. This is, these are pictures from Excel London, a huge, successful conference center, um, full for all sorts of exhibitions. In the, the end of March 2020, uh, this was converted into one of the seven Nightingale hospitals in the UK. So the UK uh, armed services, our military forces are used to creating field hospitals overseas for uh, 
in, in disaster situations <laughs> and others, but it's a long time since we have had to do it in the UK, um, I'm glad to say. Uh, so the decision to build these Nightingale hospitals, these additional whole facilities, was a huge one for us. And the decision was to convert existing structures so that the, we thought the fastest way to provide the space was to take existing large buildings and convert them. And actually a conference center was almost, a, if you had to, almost an ideal opportunity. And it's already a, mod, a modular structure. We brought together uh, planners, designers, healthcare uh, experts and the military and construction companies to work together to take this space and refit it as a hospital for COVID patients. So the decision was that that, that was who uh, we feared would need to come into these hospitals. Um, when we were going through the thinking, we had to think, would it be permanent or temporary? Could we convert a structure? In other situations, we have some amazing designs, even yeah. for inflatable uh, blow up operating theaters that have been used overseas. Um, it's not the physical structure as much as how you can use it and the opportunity you have to make it suitable for what you need now and potentially even in the future. For the Nightingale hospitals, named after Florence Nightingale, the pioneer of nursing, we had to think, who is it for? Is it for treating patients Is it who are seriously ill? Were we providing huge critical care ventilator facilities? Um, or was this about people who had milder sy symptoms or were recovering? Or indeed, would it be for patients, not with COVID at all, but displaced from the rest of the healthcare system? So in March and April last year, when we were very new to, the, to, to understanding how this would develop, we were building for COVID treatment facilities. Um, and we knew we had to think, it was not just about having beds, although that was clearly critical and beds with ventilators. It was also thinking about all the services that go with that physical facility. So how would staff get there? How would we have laboratories, pharmaceutical services, changing rooms for staff, delivery of, of PPE, catering for, for the people who would be working there, even mortuaries. Um, and it's it, it, the, the list, when you start to think about everything you need to service a healthcare operation, it is huge. One of our obvious, but our biggest learning if taken from all of this is above all, you need the staff, you need the people. And one of the things we've learned as you go through is that we can create phys physical facilities fast. I mean, remarkably fast and impressively, but you need trained, dedicated people to run them. Um, and that is hard to provide as fast. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. In the thinking about how to make this additional facility, we were trying to build them well, not just to build them. Um, although that was clearly the critical feature we felt was to get this, this capacity available for, for patients who were there. But we wanted to make the facilities as resistant as possible to spreading transmission, uh, to spreading the virus. Um, and that's to do with people flow and where goods are and where you walk and how you dispose of your PPE, 
and where a doctor comes from one patient to the other, the surfaces you use, really some basic but completely fundamental points. Then if you have the opportunity, it's how do you make that space responsive? And particularly when you start thinking about what would come next, are these facilities we could reuse even in a different circumstance? Um, and then in our own hospitals, in the existing facilities, how do you make, how do you design these to allow change? Quite often we specialize, we, we make them absolutely suitable for one specific requirement. But actually maybe what we should be thinking about is knowing and understanding that needs will change. And how do you make it meet the needs, but also be versatile? Just to mention an exa a different example of making capacity available, laboratories. Um, it seems that we named everything in this process. So it was Nightingale Hospital Lighthouse Laboratories. Lighthouse because in the PCR test that we have all learned so much about, you use a fluorescent light and that's where it came from. Um, we started with a centralized set of facilities. We realized that we couldn't test nearly enough people. We couldn't provide, we couldn't nearly meet the need. And the decision on this, because of what was available, is that we partnered with a whole range of other laboratory facilities from the private sector, from charities, non-government organizations, academia. And we have gradually developed and accredited a, a network of laboratories who are now providing a huge testing capacity to the UK. Um, and we, we were quite proud by the end of April that we had testing. And then it became obvious that the need was far greater and it increased and increased. And we've continued to bring to build this network. Gives me the opportunity to mention quality control is still really important. It's not just being able to care for patients but being able to care for them properly. And in the laboratory situation, we still accredited these new facilities. It, this wasn't a random, oh, you can test, fantastic. It's still important to keep a control mechanism on these important services. Perhaps fundamentally, was looking at the capacity within the existing hospital network, because that's where the expertise, the built up facilities, they're not new, they don't have all the bugs of new build. They are the best place in some ways where you have all the services needed. One of the things we found with the Nightingale hospitals is we built to meet the, the intense critical ventilation needs of COVID patients, perhaps before we realized how much other care they needed, how much this affected other human organ systems. Um, hospitals have that already available and the expertise. So just to think about making this capacity available within hospitals, there was a lot of modeling and we had used modeling before in the NHS system because every winter we have difficulties with the, the flu season, our intensive care, our critical care facilities fill up. So that modeling was quickly pivoted to look at the way, the steps we could take, the interventions to make more COVID capacity available. Very early, we canceled what we call elective surgery, anything that wasn't immediately critical. So that freed up the staff and the beds, uh, the services um, that would have been taken by those patients. We collaborated with the private healthcare network, which is not so large in the UK. You have much more uh, 
capacity and and opportunity here in in Indonesia. We brought back recently retired healthcare staff, doctors, students, uh, sorry, doctors, nurses, other staff. We brought in newly qualified staff very quick, much more quickly than they would normally into full-time patient care and final care student, final year students. And we have paid them, I'd like to say, um, but we allowed requalification for the recently retired and that increased our health personnel hugely. And that was absolutely vital. I won't go through this modeling, but if you just look at the graph on the left, the areas where the capacity is really low for critical care for us is nurses. And that's been now, particularly in, in our third wave, which we're just coming through, has been the biggest difficulty and resource for us. We've had to allow changes where normally it would be one nurse to one patient, in an intensive care unit, we're dealing with one to three, one to four. We've brought other staff in from the healthcare system just to sit with patients in intensive care and call when they need that nursing attention, high focus attention, because we don't have enough critically care trained nurses. So really thinking about what you need the most intensive resources for and how you can help patients on the step up, step down and displacement phases. So just, just for example, uh, the Royal London, they increased from 40, 40 uh, low 40s, maybe 42 critical care beds to 150 uh, within about two weeks, just by making all these changes. And that's been repeated across the country and has been absolutely vital. I know I'm coming back to this, but it apply, it's been really important in our existing hospitals. We'd spent a long time making hospitals more friendly places for patients to have their family around them because that's how they re recover faster and better. It's been a big shock to our thinking really to focus on uh, an infection control uh, uh, set up for the moment in these COVID treating hospitals and we've had to minimize access that means mothers giving birth without the father there it means family not at the bed of patients who are being put, sedated to be put on ventilators and may not see them again and how we use online FaceTime to allow some contact without uh, the risk of further transmission to the patients, to the staff. Minimizing time spent, really basic things, no waiting rooms. You book an appointment, you come in, you leave. Minimizing touch on shared services. And we've, we've never seen so many uh, automated remote sensors. You, know, you don't push the button anymore. You, it, some very... It's almost not innovation, except in how you use it. So it's really thinking through the, the risk areas. I know I don't have much longer, but just to say it's not all about the physical facilities. Many things come into creating capacity in a system. I've talked about people, but it's also using other opportunities. So using telemedicine to make sure that people can get, can access healthcare, even if it's not physically, uh, because you know, to reduce that infection risk and opportunity, even in their travel, let alone to the healthcare staff. And this, so in the UK, the use of telemedicine in primary care from the general practitioner, the clinic has just rocketed. We've been trying for 20 years to bring this into, into good use. It, I feel we've, we've got over the hurdle now. It was a big change for doctors and now everyone can see the value.
Um, and the UK has an MOU with the Ministry of Health here. We're very proud to be collaborating and supporting each other on in, in that area. And it's technical as well. There's a lot of antibiotic being used while people are in hospital and being treated for COVID. That just opens the door more to some of the other pandemic, well, some of the other threats to global health. And antimicrobial resistance, we hear about as a problem. The, the systems for dealing with that and other infections, we can't afford to lose sight of those, even while we are you know, struggling to manage the current situation. So just, I hope, given you an idea of some of the areas of innovation, some of the things we're proud of achieving, but some of the things we just didn't realize. And we have to learn as we go on. And we are learning. And it, this is, we are definitely still learning. It's reinforced our uh, knowledge that we have to focus on healthy communities in the first place. In the UK, we have what's called an obesity crisis. Many people are overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, uh, have high blood pressure. And those are all illnesses. They are not communicable in the same way as an infection is, but they make COVID much, much worse. Um, and so having a healthy community to start with is vital. Then there's how we address protection and control of infection in the community, hand washing, masks, distance, but also in all our healthcare settings. And thinking about how can you be ready to respond to a surge without having to maintain this vast resource at the times it's not needed. And that's whether you can do it differently always, whether you need to have facilities in reserve. And above all, for us, it has come down to the people. We have had amazing innovation, technically, construction, physically, but the key has been the people and the response of the UK population to those staff. Um, and this is the NHS, people, when they're saying we are grateful for the NHS, they mean the physical service, but they really mean the nurses and the doctors who treat them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Diane. It's very uh, encouraging to note just like in the UK and Indonesia as well, that there are a lot of innovations that are born out of crisis. I think um, as a policy manager in health, um, I would like to note how just to, in 2019, we were really trying to push innovations as well as cooperations in telemedicine, right? But we hit like a lot of roadblocks just because a lot of people say uh, said that the MOH or the Indonesian Ministry of Health hadn't really released a regulation at the ministerial level uh, that would allow uh, telemedicine, right? So there were a lot of questions about potential infringement of privacy and other aspects that are um, still in very gray area. But as we now can see that even the Minister, uh, the Minister of Health itself, as well as at the provincial level, we really have uh, engaged start startups who are working in telemedicine. And you know what, we just like do it as we go. So we learn from practice uh, rather than just waiting from regulation from the sky to get down on earth and then start telemedicine. So it's really interesting to see that and encouraging and hopeful for other innovations going forward. So thank you. And I would uh, really like to ask you again about uh, that scarcity in health workers, uh, namely in uh, nurse for nurses, because we're also experiencing uh, the same issue in Jakarta, right? So how can we solve this issue together? So thank you again. 
And to Dr. Carl Lofgren, uh, the floor is yours. But before that, I think it, it's interesting to note how uh, when talking about ICT in your presentation, when I'm looking at New Zealand's facts now, right? And how many active cases are in New Zealand. And I hope it's all our dreams come true if we would ever reach 67 active cases ever in both Jakarta or in the UK um, because the UK has entered I think it's third lockdown just last month right uh, meanwhile the New Zealand is in alert one level which means that the risk of exposure or risk of communal transmission for COVID-19 is very very low and it's somewhere there so it's very heartening to see how people will be able to go outdoor and just enjoy some summer fun. So without further ado, uh, we would like to learn from you, Dr. Lofgren, the floor is yours. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's almost four o'clock here in Wellington. It's uh, Wednesday afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the digital state and COVID-19 experience from New Zealand and elsewhere. Um, gosh, I should actually make, sorry for this, uh, yeah. Here we go, sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna say something about the use of new information and communication technologies and COVID-19 uh, with some experience from New Zealand and elsewhere. Uh, the reason why I'm talking about this is that I was contributing to an article co-authored with no less than 21 authors last year about how different jurisdictions around the world had used new information technologies, uh, social media, and other technical devices to as in the response to COVID-19. Uh, it was published in Information Polity. It's open access. I will share it with the organizers so that you can um, download it yourself. Um, just quickly say something about the situation in New Zealand. Um, as already been mentioned, I think we are in a very, very lucky spot. Um, the country was locked down in March last year, in 2020, uh, following some community transmission. New Zealand is in the lucky position, but we are always the last person to be hit by everything from the rest of the world, whether it's positive or negative. So, for example, streaming, I think we were we were probably the last country in the world to receive streaming videos like Netflix. It came very, very late to New Zealand. In the case of COVID-19, we were very, very lucky because at the time of a lockdown, we knew what was coming. We knew what the challenges would be. Uh, and following some cabinet uh, meetings in government, um, the cabinet decided to go to lockdown, complete lockdown. And I think it's, Compare, I think if we compare to other parts of the world, it was probably almost as brutal as the Chinese lockdown in, um, in Wuhan. Um, and that lasted for a month, after which we gradually went up the different alert levels. And I would say from July, we have had no new real cases of community transmission in New Zealand. So our lives are quite back to normal. Uh, as a university professor, I go to office every day. Um, most shops are open, are operating as normal. Most pubs, restaurants, cultural events, everything is just as normal. So in that sense, we are in a very, very lucky spot. But enough about that. <laughs> and uh, uh, in terms of why we were successful, I should just mention, I think it was 50% very determined and well-managed governmental decisions, 50% it was sheer luck. We were lucky that we are where we are and we could stop it. Okay, let's continue to the digital state and COVID-19. So the background is that information management is a key factor in all types of crisis management. So when we talk about using digital devices, new ICTs, social media, the internet, or whatever. This is not something new. This is something we have done for many, many years. And in the New Zealand case, this is something which the government is used to do. So for example, 
uh, during um, the, the 2011 Christchurch Canterbury earthquake, um, the government was well prepared to use Facebook and other types of social media um, platforms for as a response to the earthquake. Most of the um, disaster management uh, agencies in New Zealand are using social media and other types of digital devices on a regular basis. So we are quite used to use ICTs when it comes to crisis management. Um, and compared to traditional information channels, new digital tools are alleged to be faster, more efficient, more prevalent, more precise, accurate, and more engaging with the community. So there are sort of very sort of, sort of built up understanding of new digital platforms are better than traditional informational platforms. As always, you need information management in all types of crisis management, and this is not something which came with the internet. This is as old as crisis and modern governance. Um, what I would like to emphasize, though, is when we talk about ICTs, digital platforms, social media, etc., there are two stories here. One story is about this is an efficient way of actually solving problems. We have problems, uh, we need to respond to something, and therefore we use digital tools. That's a story I want to hear. Then there's the other story, which unfortunately I've heard several times now since the pandemic disappeared, where we have the tools, where are the problems? Um, unfortunately, when we talk about digital state or digital government or e-government or whatever we choose to call it, there is this idea that this is not actually about solving problems. This is about branding ourselves, our organizations, our nation, etc. For those of you who are from Indonesia, you've probably heard about Singapore one million times and about their success in the government. One can say that's an interesting story, but it's not about solving problems. It's not about delivering solutions to citizens. That is about, look, we are the best, invest in us. And that's a story I think we should avoid, in particular when we talk about disasters and pandemics. So, but let me now turn to some of the digital solutions we have used in New Zealand. Uh, and I will be quite frank about them because they have not just been success stories. There have also been a couple of, I wouldn't say disasters, but failures. Uh, and equally, we have been in a lucky situation. So I don't think anyone has been hurt because of the failures, but I think we can learn something from them. The first story is the Tracer apps. Um, so this is uh, an app for smartphones developed by the New Zealand Ministry of Health. Um, it was developed just before we came out our first lockdown or a lockdown last year. The problem was it was delayed. Uh, at the time of the release of a lockdown, uh, there wasn't a Tracer app, there was no system, but the government had decided that all companies, all organizations in New Zealand had to keep records of the people visiting the buildings. Uh, and the reason, well, so I would say one of the reasons why it got delayed was because in New Zealand, privacy is very important. And during the development phase, the app went through a so-called privacy impact assessment to make sure that it was safe in terms of privacy. Because unlike some countries, privacy is something people really herald in New Zealand. We're very, very careful about sharing private data with uh, non-authorized sources. And we're not too happy that the government sit with too much data. So this is an app which I would say is very efficient in the sense that you, as the owner of a smartphone, you keep the data on the phone. It's not shared with any public agency. However, you have the records in case there should be community transmission and the government can also, through Bluetooth, 
contact you and tell you that you have been close to someone which may have been infected by COVID-19. So in that sense, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good tool for keeping track of people, rather letting people keep in track of their own movements, and at the same time being able to alert people without storing the data. But I should mention that at the beginning, when this app was released, we had probably five to 10 different apps operating in New Zealand. And there were no coordination. There were also district health boards who refused to use them, to apply them, which meant that people going into hospital, hospitals where you're very likely to contract uh, any kind of disease, including COVID-19, were not tracing people. So the startup phase was quite chaotic. Nowadays, it's quite okay. Uh, there are still some complaints from the ministry uh, that people have become complacent. They're not using it because it's not compulsory to use it. It's compulsory for business owners, for organizations to make sure that they have the OCR code in the shop so that people can uh, register their visit but it's not compulsory for visitors to actually uh, check in. So that's the first example. Second example, and this is perhaps very obvious, is social media. So uh, Ministry of Health and other health organizations were using social media from the lockdown, and we are still doing it. Um, I think it's not as prevalent as it used to be, but it's still a very important part of the response to COVID-19. And it's the traditional health warnings. It's, of course, encouraging people to wash their hands, to use sanitizers, and of course, to use the app, the Tracer app in the smartphone. So this is something you use social media for. And you, I think you target lots of um, groups who not normally watch traditional television or read newspapers or listen to the radio. But I wouldn't say it's something exceptional in terms of innovations in New Zealand. Uh, the third one, which I like to mention, not because it's something which has been um, particularly announced in New Zealand, but which I believe is important in the international context, is the so-called dashboards, where government can produce and present uh, hard facts about, well, in this case, it's about the social impact of COVID-19, but it can also be normal medical statistics. The reason why I mentioned this is that in some countries, this has been quite controversial, but you actually have an independent source about COVID-19 and its impact, particularly in countries where you have no uh, public service broadcasting companies, and where you all have to rely on private sources. And in particular, I know from my co-authors in the US, this was something really controversial in the US, to present hard facts from an independent source about um, the impact of COVID-19. Um, a fourth example, and this is a bit com more complicated, is using ICTs for managed isolation vouchers. So if you're traveling to New Zealand at the moment, well, you won't be let in unless you are either a New Zealand citizen or a New Zealand permanent resident. Um, if you're allowed to travel in, you need to in advance get a voucher to one of the managed isolation facilities, which means hotel for 14 days in quarantine, more or less locked up in a hotel room. And uh, the reason why I mention this is because I would say this is one of the failures in the system. So obviously there are lots of people around the world who are either New Zealand citizens or residents who would like to return to New Zealand at this time. And there are a limited number of seats or places in these managed isolation hotels or quarantine hotels. So you need to get this before you can actually purchase an airline ticket, let alone uh, enter New Zealand. 
And the New Zealand government, and this is the Ministry of Business and Innovation and Employment, or is in charge of this, um, they only allow people to apply three months in advance. So obviously, there are lots of people who are fighting and struggling to get one of these vouchers. What happened was that some smart IT person sitting in London in the UK, of course, figured out how to break the system and get forward and jump the queue. And despite the fact that the ministry has several times said they have closed the loop of a gap, which is no longer possible, there are still cases of people managed to get forward in the queue. And this is, of course, it's about technology, it's about security, but it also shows that using ICT system can sometimes, yeah, have some unintended effects. Um, and I would like to finish off by saying something about, about these challenges uh, in terms of the government responses. One thing we haven't talked about here today is that we only talk about responses. We don't talk about preparedness and we don't talk about recovery, which are the other sides of any type of disaster or pandemic. Um, but let's stick to the response. And the first thing which is very important to remember is the context. It's a pandemic, challenging circumstances. To just say, well, let's go digital instead, somehow ignores the fact that there are lots of things during a pandemic you can't do when you, for example, want to design and develop new digital devices. There are quite challenging circumstances. I personally feel sometimes quite offended by politicians, civil servants talking about, well, university um, teaching, you can just go online and do distance, distance online learning instead. We, when I talk now from personal <laughs> experiences, got three days to somehow uh, maintain some kind of interface interaction with our students. It wasn't distant online learning, it was emergency remote learning, trying to solve a crisis. I saw, once again, some people are taking advantage of it saying, oh, we can just go online now. And of course, there are lots of universities around the world would love to see us do more online teaching so we could sell off expensive buildings and offices. But I would like to maintain that when we talk about response, the context of the pandemic actually makes it very, very hard to quickly respond digitally. The second problem or challenge is the difficulty to evaluate effectiveness. How effective are these tools? Yes, of course, we can, can show them off and they probably look very good uh, in international context, but how effective are they? Once again, we are halfway through a pandemic, halfway through our responses. We won't know how effective these tools are until many years later, or at least later. The third problem, and this is a chronic problem with all types of digital devices, is accessibility. The tracker app or the tracer app I talked about sounds like a very good uh, device for tracing people's visits to various organizations, offices, buildings, shops. The problem with this app is it requires that your smartphone is quite new. And apparently, uh, I mean, this shouldn't come as a surprise, uh, lots of people use, still use very old phones, old smartphones, old iPhones and the app doesn't work. Plus the fact there are actually lots of people who don't use smartphones, who don't want to use the internet, who don't want to, or haven't got the access to it, or can't afford it. There are a number of reasons, but there are always groups who are excluded when we talk about digital devices, uh, social media platform, etc. The fourth challenge, surveillance and privacy. Once again, this is also something we see pop up all the time when we talk about new digital devices, is that what happens to the data you store? What happens to the information 
you share with others. And it's not because me and some of my colleagues think there is a big conspiracy, uh, big tech or big government or whatever. It's simply that we are humans. Information which have been shared, private information can be misused and is actually being misused as we speak. We have had so many data breaches in New Zealand. We have had so many examples of people actually abusing, misusing personal data, which has been collected for purposeful reasons. A fifth reason is conflating private and public sector interests. Uh, I'm quite surprised to hear that lots of academic writing about COVID-19 is about the relationship between the public sector and the communities, which of course is a very positive thing. But it's less about the interaction between private and public sector interests. And of course, I could mention something about vaccines. I won't do that. <laughs> uh, but there is there are different driving motives bet between public sector and private sector. Sometimes some people seem to think, well, we all have this joint interest. No, we haven't. And just to mention something, which has not so much to do with ICT, is these um, uh, quarantine facilities, the hotels in New Zealand, were originally actually so, um, under the management of private security companies. They had to be released because the quality of their work was in, wasn't um, what wasn't good enough. Basically, these security companies hired low paid staff with very few qualifications because they, they wanted to, be, to get the cheap solution. And it didn't work. And there were people actually escaping facilities. You had staff ignoring people leaving facilities. So what happened at the end was the New Zealand government had to call in the army, or actually the Air Force, soldiers to guard the facilities. Um, the next item I got here is ownership of data and intellectual property. And this probably concerns many of the apps around the world, which is run by private companies. What will happen with the data once the pandemic is over? Will someone own the intellectual property of it? And finally, which is relating to both uh, accessibility and ownership of data and intellectual property, it's about fairness. So I would say there are lots of good things with using digital platforms, using social media, internet, etc. cetera, um, but there are also some, some challenges. Fortunately, we haven't seen many of them in New Zealand, uh, but I think we will see more of that around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lofgren. When you were mentioning at the very end how uh, with the proliferation of digital platforms that uh, there come challenges, right, that naturally accompany it. Uh, it comes to my mind how uh, with the enablement of social media platform and just like other digital media um, channels, there's also a rise of possibilities for misinformation and hoaxes, right? Uh, controversies, uh, as you see, uh, as you saw earlier, that uh, a lot of people might try to or attempt uh, at misusing the data that they have, or even like jumping the, the queue for like the isolation places, right? So I was wondering later on, uh, number one is how did the government or how is the government still trying to uh, manage the misinformation for COVID-19 pandemic? That's perhaps like number one of my curiosity because in Jakarta, we're definitely uh, seeing that on Twitter and Instagram and whatnot. And secondly, I'm also interested how like a lot of your ICT or New Zealand's ICT platforms is uh, they're focusing a lot on uh, COVID-19 outbreak, right? Or the outbreak, outbreak control. Uh, how is the economic recovery coming into play in this whole uh, planning for ICT usage? So I think those two things are key learnings that I would like to hear your insights, uh, New Zealand's insight, and then really implement it to Jakarta case. Thank you so much. Thank you.
So we still have 50 minutes. And now for our last speaker, I would hand it over to Ibu Suharti Sutar, who will talk about cooperations in Jakarta context and beyond on COVID-19. Please, Ibu Suharti, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share my presentation. Uh, Selamat pagi semuanya. Uh, terima kasih Bu, Bu Mbak Tisya. Uh, and thank you Bu Bayan and uh, Dr. Kat Lokrin for joining us this morning. But please allow me to speak Bahasa Indonesia this morning and I'll share you the uh, English versions of my presentations. And so we have a, a translation so, uh, also in this uh, um, Seminar, teman-teman uh, semua saya akan uh, berbagi terkait dengan bagaimana uh, Jakarta melawan COVID melalui kolaborasi. Uh, Pak Gubernur dari hari pertama penantinya bermaksud membangun Jakarta. Wait, I I could, uh, let me, let me, let me. Uh, Where is suaranya kok keluar translationnya? Alright. Uh, bahwa Jakarta akan dibangun menggunakan uh, Paradigma kolaborasi City for Point Zero di mana Pemda uh, Pak ini ini yang lain dengar suaranya saya double tidak ya? Nope, uh, you're clear to me. Oke, okay, alright, Ibu. Because I I I, I have my own uh, uh, voice and also the uh, translators. I think I have to change it. Itu justru itu justru kenapa kenapa ada ya wait 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 di mana ya I, I, I couldn't I couldn't find the I couldn't find the uh, uh, the interpret I saw it I saw it but not anymore wait 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 <coughs> I can't find it here. I couldn't find it here. Oh my goodness. Gak apa-apa bisa ya? Bisa ya? Oke. 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 Oke, good. Uh, jadi, uh, pemerintah Jakarta akan membangun Jakarta menggunakan paradigma 4.0 di mana warganya betul-betul bisa menjadi co-creator. Bersama Pemda, uh, dari mulai perencanaan sampai uh, eksekusinya. Berbeda dari paradigma uh, sebelumnya di mana warga itu hanya maksimum sebagai uh, partisipan. Tidak ikut uh, mengatur, tidak ikut mengambil uh, keputusan. Dan itu diwujudkan dengan pertama menjadikan uh, uh, Jakarta City of Collaboration ini menjadi uh, uh, brand city dan dibangunnya uh, GDCN Jakarta Development Collaboration Network kebetulan saya sebagai ketua uh, hariannya. Jejaring ini merupakan jejaring dari uh, para ahli dan juga stakeholder lainnya uh, yang bersama-sama diniatkan untuk membantu menyelesaikan permasalahan Jakarta. Dan tentunya menciptakan uh, uh, standar bagaimana kolaborasi itu harus dikerjakan dan uh, tentunya meningkatkan kompetensi. Kita hanya kompetensi dari uh, Pemda, tetapi juga uh, uh, yang uh, lain. Platform Jakarta, uh, JDCN, kita punya uh, Pemda, ada juga pemerintah pusat, dan juga uh, partner lain. Ada private sectors, ada LSM, ada uh, UMKM, ada uh, banyak pihak. Uh, nah, pemerintah Pemda 
melakukan eksekusi melalui SKPD, melalui BUMD. Sementara nasional bisa melakukannya melalui kementerian sendiri atau juga melalui dekonsentrasi. Nah, yang ini, yang lainnya ini, kita perlu dikolaborasikan. Dan bersama-sama nanti di tengah tengahnya operasinya JDC itu menjadikan eksekusi, koordinasi, dan kreasi ini menjadi satu kesatuan. Sehingga pelaksanaannya nanti akan menjadi ter, terpadu, terintegratif. Ini yang dikerjakan, karena ada COVID, maka sejak bulan April, BGCN bergerak, berubah menjadi fokusnya ke penanganan COVID-19. Jadi, mulai dari uh, memastikan bahwa logistik uh, kesehatan ada kita tahu waktu itu suasananya sangat uh, tidak baik APD tidak ada uh, hand sanitizer saja habis di mana-mana disinfektan sulit uh, di, di, diperoleh kita melakukan kolaborasi untuk itu juga untuk tenaga kesehatan kita sediakan akomodasinya, transportasinya, uh, 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 insentifnya, dan, dan uh, lain sebagainya. Memastikan bahwa mereka terlindungi betul. Dan yang tidak kalah uh, uh, adalah kita melakukan kolaborasi sosial berskala besar. Jadi ada untuk kebutuhan pangan, ada untuk membantu UMKM, uh, untuk pendidikan. Nanti akan saya jelaskan lebih lanjut di berikutnya. Uh, Uh, ini terkait dengan logistik kesehatan kita melakukan kerjasama dengan international organizations kita kerjasama dengan uh, sister cities Jakarta kita punya banyak kebetulan dan uh, di dalam pandemi ini kita justru uh, membangun uh, kolaborasi menjadi lebih kuat lagi melalui uh, 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 berbagai macam uh, moda. Kemudian juga warga asing yang di Jakarta karena juga jumlahnya juga tidak sedikit, kita juga bisa mem, uh, uh, berkumpul dengan mereka untuk uh, memperoleh bantuan-bantuan untuk warga Jakarta, termasuk juga untuk tenaga kesehatan. Perusahaan asing multinasional membantu banyak uh, uh, dalam menyediakan berbagai macam kebutuhan untuk uh, kesehatan. Ini contoh untuk uh, dari sister cities dan juga lembaga internasional lain. Berlin menyediakan banyak uh, uh, bantuan, kota Schulz menyediakan uh, PCR. Ini ada cerita teman-teman uh, semua, Bapak Ibu, bagaimana uh, PCR ini diperoleh. Jadi dulu pada saat kami kesulitan betul meningkatkan uh, kapasitas testing, kita mengirim surat ke uh, wali kota-wali kota dunia uh, sebagai teman, sister city kita. Kita peroleh uh, jawaban bahwa mereka tidak bisa membantu karena mereka sendiri juga membutuhkan. Akhirnya kita mengirim surat lagi. Kalau begitu melalui Pak Gubernur suratnya kami pinjam, kami pinjam alat PCR kalian Jakarta sangat terbatas dan mereka mengatakan bahwa meminjamkan pun tidak bisa karena mereka juga butuh. Tetapi ada beberapa kota yang akhirnya mengirimkan bantuan eh, hibah supaya eh, bisa kami gunakan dan alhamdulillah ini meningkatkan kapasitas yang luar biasa. Dua minggu yang lalu kami mendapatkan juga bantuan dari organisasi Nama Foundation bersama Human Initiative dan iLabs, tiga mobil PCR. Dan ini hanya contoh saja. Dan yang contoh saja, apa yang diperoleh oleh Jakarta melalui kolaborasi kita. Kemauan diperlukan untuk mengetuk pintu. Bagaimana kita uh, menyampaikan bahwa ini uh, butuh uh, bantuan dari uh, mana-mana, ya. Dan uh, 
ini terkait dengan layanan kesehatan kita juga dibantu dari tentunya dari pemerintah pusat dari komunitas bisnis dari warga juga ini contoh lagi untuk penyediaan hotel untuk tenaga kesehatan untuk jejaring lab kita sekarang punya 90 lab bayangkan bulan Maret kita hanya punya satu lab dan uh, dengan ada yang ada sekarang lebih dari 25 ribu tes bisa dilakukan setiap hari di Jakarta. Rumah sakit juga begitu, kita sekarang sudah berjejaring dengan 101 rumah sakit. Dari semula hanya 8 rumah sakit saja. Hal lain yang dilakukan juga dengan uh, pemerintah pusat dan uh, universitas, pemerintah pusat tentunya menyediakan banyak hal. Uh, yang saya ingin tekankan di sini terkait dengan kuliah kerja nyata, tematik ini yang kita bangun bersama dengan uh, uh, BNPB, memastikan bahwa anak-anak uh, mahasiswa yang mahasiswa yang Jakarta yang kuliah di manapun, tetapi mereka sedang tidak kuliah, mereka melakukan KTM di Jakarta. Membantu warga, mengedukasi warga terkait dengan COVID dan berbagai macam bantuan yang lain yang dikerjakan oleh mahasiswa-mahasiswa tersebut. Ini KSBB. Jakarta membuat KSBB di inisiasi menjelang bulan puasa tahun lalu. Kami berpikir bahwa di dalam uh, situasi pandemi pasti uh, masyarakat ingin membantu lebih. Masyarakat ingin membantu lebih uh, dan uh, kami siapkan platformnya. Memastikan bahwa warga bisa membantu warga lain yang lain dan Jakarta Pemda hanya bersifat sebagai uh, 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 kolaborator untuk menghubungkan mereka. Jadi dimulai dari pangan waktu itu. Jadi warga e, menyediakan bantuan itu bisa e, e, individu, bisa e, komunitas, bisa e, e, perusahaan. Dan mereka bisa mem, e, memberikan sendiri, tetapi juga bisa dibantu oleh agregator jika mereka tidak bisa membantu, e, menyalurkannya sendiri. Atau jika mereka tidak bisa menyediakan secara full. Dan e, Pemprov DKI di sini menyediakan platformnya, jadi sebagai e, e, mak compra, mana yang butuh, mana yang e, 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 siap memberikan, kita siapkan kita kolaborasinya, jadi yang akan membantu e, memilih sendiri siapa yang akan dibantu. Dan itu kemudian di eksekusi berikutnya. Jadi kita lebih ke arah sebagai membantu mengelola, tidak mengeksekusi langsung. Dan memastikan bahwa bantuan-bantuan itu dikelola secara akuntabel. Ini contoh hasilnya. Teman-teman bisa melihat di website corona.jakarta.go.id di situ ada uh, PSBB, apa yang bisa sudah disiapkan, uh, bagaimana hasilnya semua tersedia di situ. Dan KSBB ini tidak hanya terbatas kemudian di pangan, tidak hanya terbatas di UMKM, kita bergerak ke pendidikan uh, untuk membantu anak-anak miskin yang tidak punya gawai, guru-guru yang tidak punya komputer, dan ribuan akhirnya sudah bisa di, uh, diberikan ke mereka. Sekarang kita sedang menyiapkan untuk uh, perkukiman, untuk perumahan, dan juga untuk pengelolaan sampah, dan lain-lain. Jadi e, bermula dari PSBB kita bergerak ke sektor-sektor lain yang juga ternyata e, sangat dibutuhkan untuk e, warga Jakarta. Jadi e, mudah-mudahan dengan semua kolaborasi yang kita e, siapkan ini e, akan membuat e, Jakarta menjadi lebih baik e, dan tentunya warga ikut terlibat betul di dalam e, menangani masalah-masalah e, e, Jakarta. 
eh, ini terkait dengan mitra luar negeri. Bagaimana kita, ini pengalaman yang menarik sekali waktu waktu uh, awal-awal COVID, kita tahu bahwa rumah sakit ini masih berjalan sendiri-sendiri. RSUD dikelola terpisah. Mekensi, uh, Conferi datang uh, uh, membantu kami menyiapkan berbagai macam SOP. Memastikan bahwa uh, seluruh titik-titik kritikal yang dihadapi oleh rumah sakit itu di, uh, ditangani dengan uh, baik. Jadi uh, ini uh, bahan-bahannya juga bisa di-share ke teman-teman yang lain, termasuk dari provinsi lain, apa saja yang harus dikerjakan. Jangan sampai ada sesuatu yang kritikal terlewat dari uh, uh, kacamata uh, kita semua. Dan uh, kemarin akhir tahun uh, kita menyelenggarakan JDCN Forum satu untuk uh, showcasing apa yang sudah dikerjakan oleh uh, Jakarta uh, yang dikerjakan oleh JDCN dan tentunya kolaborasi-kolaborasi lainnya. Kita bisa menghadirkan 42 pembicara dari dalam dan luar negeri bahkan dari 9 negara yang terlibat uh, 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 narasumbernya. Kemudian uh, kedua kita belajar dari negara lain, kita ingin belajar dari organisasi lain, dan yang berikutnya adalah kita berdiskusi, menggalang apa yang kemudian bisa dikolaborasikan pada ke depan. Tidak hanya uh, oleh kita sendiri, oleh uh, DKI, Sorry, sorry. Is it? Kita mencari ide-ide baru, mengundang semua untuk uh, diskusi, mencari ide-ide baru uh, untuk uh, penanganan masalah Jakarta ke depan. Dan kami memulai juga untuk kolaborasi dengan daerah-daerah lain. Mudah-mudahan apa yang kita kerjakan uh, ini uh, bisa kita tindak lanjuti lebih lanjut tentunya. Uh, kita sekarang sedang dalam proses untuk verifikasi secara detail apa saja yang diusulkan untuk uh, ke depan. Dan itu nanti ide-ide itu kemudian diterjemahkan ke dalam program-program yang akan dikerjakan baik melalui yang di uh, 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 dibiayai oleh pemerintah eh, Jakarta maupun juga yang akan di, perlu dibiayai eh, oleh eh, semua melalui kolaborasi. Ini beberapa hal yang menjadi keunggulan JDCN eh, di dalam eh, kemitraan termasuk kemitraan internasional adalah bahwa eh, jelas mandatnya eh, kita memang diberi tugas oleh eh, Pemda untuk melakukan eh, kolaborasi itu. Kemudian, political will uh, definitely is needed. Uh, uh, semua, tidak hanya Pak Gubernur, Pak Gubernur, kami sampai semua Pemda dan uh, semua uh, staff selalu berpikir sekarang. Ketika kita melakukan program, apakah ini uh, bisa dikolaborasikan? Kita mengetuk-ngetuk pintu, kita mengundang semua untuk bisa uh, berkolaborasi. Dan kepercayaan yang dibangun ini ternyata membuahkan hasil dan ke depan tentunya masih ada yang perlu diperbaiki uh, lots of uh, space for improvement kita punya uh, uh, jangkauan yang perlu diperluas uh, negara lain juga masih banyak yang belum uh, kita jangkau kita ker uh, kerjasama dengan uh, international business di Jakarta kemudian tentunya berbagi pengalaman apa yang sudah dikerjakan ya, kepada pihak lain dan tetap e, mengundang pihak lain untuk berbagi pengalaman kepada e, kita baik itu melalui e, forum bilateral, multilateral atau e, e, hanya internal di Jakarta dan di Indonesia itu yang bisa saya e, share pagi hari ini mudah-mudahan e, bisa memberikan e, sedikit informasi terkait apa yang dikerjakan oleh Jakarta kolaborasi yang dilakukan Jakarta untuk e, memperkuat e, penanganan COVID-19 e, e, 
Pertanyaan-pertanyaan uh, disilakan uh, nanti akan saya coba uh, menjawabnya. Ide-ide uh, gratis juga tentunya akan kami uh, harapkan. Terima kasih banyak. Thank you so much, Ibu Soharti. Um, I think we need to appreciate and give credit to the governor as well as to yourself and to the team at the City Hall about showing, uh, I think, consistently this political will to collaborate, right? And it is not only collaborating with the big names, as you mentioned, McKinsey, and then we have PricewaterhouseCoopers and many others, Corn Ferry, definitely, who help us in a lot of uh, our hospital referral systems and vaccination mechanism, but also that uh, the fact that we have engaged and really uh, befriended people on the grassroots level right so as you can as you said earlier about the large scale social collaboration atau KSBB kerjasama sosial kolaborasi sosial berskala besar you you know that how the government might have initiated or engaged the private sector to help with the KSBB or the large scale social collaboration but the end at the end of the day it is the end user or the subject of such help who execute and even choose how are they going to be helped and what is their priority for now. So uh, thank you for that. And definitely my kudos to the governor, to yourself and to the team at the city hall. And uh, I'm interested to know as well whether the large scale of social collaboration would, let, uh, would later be expanded into collaboration to build more physical facilities for quarantine as well as hospitalization purposes as well as a collaboration on an ICT uh, scale or ICT platform. So interested to ask you about that. But without further ado, let's open our Q&A session. We have half an hour to go and we have many, many uh, questions here on my Google Doc. I think we have more than five for each uh, speaker, but uh, for, uh, with the interest of time, I will only ask uh, two questions uh, to each speaker. So, okay, I hope you are ready for that. Um, the first speaker that would, I would like to ask is Miss Zoe Dan from the British uh, Embassy in Jakarta. In talking about search hospitals, when we think about ex expanding the number of beds, it seems more like a curative approach, right? It kind of gives a psychological signaling to people that you don't really need to worry because everybody will always get treatment if they need it because a bed is available. So the question from our audience is, is this policy prepared as actually a last option? So that's the first part of the question. And secondly, how is the government focusing more on preventative measures? And what is the top preventative policy that the UK can share with Jakarta? So I think that's a, a quite a loaded a question. So I would give you the time and space to answer that. Thank you very much. I, I, I shall try not to get myself into hot political water on the last part. Sure. Um, so yes, making more beds available literally for treating people with severe COVID is a last resort. Yes. Um, in March, April last year, uh, it was done because we went from zero to a high spike in about two or three weeks. So that at the same time as imposing our first lockdown, which was the trying to prevent the transmission, we clearly already had such a high uh, infection rate that we needed additional capacity for people who were already ill, already infected and already ill. Um, and one of, one of the things that the epidemiologists knew instantly, but the, the rest of us have learnt to understand gradually is that time, uh, the curve between infection, uh, somebody becoming infected, uh, the time until they might have symptoms, what period they are infectious, how long it, it would take if they are likely to become seriously ill and need major healthcare intervention and how long they might then spend in hospital. So at the point that we lock down, you have two or three weeks, even if you could completely lock down, you know, if in, in 
a crazy sense. Everybody was instantly isolated. You still got two to three weeks before the maximum number of people would be appearing in hospital needing serious health care. Oh, okay. Um, and then the length of time they may spend in hospital, of course, that, that varies. You know, how long until you get over the bed need. Um, and so the preventative work in terms of the healthy community you know, is a period of decades in, in lifestyle changes. Whereas preventative in terms of social distant, physical distancing and social isolation so, so one of the things that is really evident to me between the UK and Indonesia is this difference in how we interpret, how we understand physical distancing and trying to be separate from people. Um, and it depends who you are. You know, if you, you live in a huge house and you can order... Happy Fresh, excuse me for mentioning the name of a company. Um, you can isolate in your house. You know, might not be so nice. You might have to watch Netflix, but you can do it. Um, if you live in a small house in a kampong with your family, uh, you can't physically isolate in the same way there. Um, it's, it, you know, the space is not available to do it. Um, and so the whole concept of preventing what transmission by keeping separate becomes very different. When I uh, talk to people who are in the UK, when they go for the exercise that they are allowed out of doors, they are, depending where they are in the country, they are or, or may be allowed to meet one other person from another household. They can't have anybody inside the house. They can't, you know, so they have to be two meters away and outdoors. Nobody visiting the home, children not seeing each other to study together. Um, so the, the concept of uh, giving signals about the danger doesn't have to, it, it's not an either or, I think I'm trying to say. You, we need to be clear about the risks and about preventative measures that you, I can take as an individual, washing my hands, keeping away, you know, as well as um, trying to respond to the, the, the immediate healthcare need. In terms of the top preventative measure, that's where um, I, I, uh, I happened to have heard a debate from our, the UK Parliament yesterday. Um, and it's, it's a, it's something that isn't a clear answer for everybody based on a scientific interpretation of distance or whatever. Um, people are very aware that the harm from the harm to the economy of, of trying to lock down compared with the harm to individuals, they have different views about the acceptability of risk and the rate of uh, trying to reopen the economy. At the moment, our children are not in school. They were in school uh, in the autumn. Now they are learning from home. They will be back in. I think maybe for me, the top preventative measure is actually is the one we really struggle to do. It's getting people to understand the risk of the things they do without thinking. Um, and that's, you know, if, you, if you're not even aware of it, how can you possibly do something about it? So I think over and above all the issues of preventing flights and, 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 active test and trace and genomic sequencing, even sort of, I mean, it's clearly alongside, but beyond all of that, it's how we communicate so that people understand. Thank you. So uh, to summarize, like there are two pathways 
in terms of the UK's preventative me- measures. The first one is, of course, what we called here uh, 3M, ya Ibu Suharti di DKI Jakarta or in Indonesia, wearing a mask, washing your head, and distancing yourself with, uh, from others, uh, just the everyday narrative. But also, what is the, the very key pathway or factor for success in preventing uh, COVID-19 is actually in something that we invest every day in our subconscious action and conscious action, and then we invest in the long term, right? Because you also talk about uh, the risk is not only about the pandemic, the risk is also uh, the rise of uh, non-communicable disease. So I think Ibu Harti would have uh, something to say uh, on that note about how Jakarta is promoting urban health, especially after the birth of this pandemic uh, early last year. Please, Ibu Harti. Yes. Uh... Jakarta sekarang sedang menyiapkan yang namanya sistem uh, bahasa. Uh, Jakarta sekarang sedang menyiapkan uh, yang namanya urban health system. Uh, sistem yang mengkolaborasikan semua, yang mengintegrasikan semua, mainstreaming uh, semua uh, uh, pembangunan menuju uh, uh, kota sehat. Jadi uh, gampangannya untuk uh, uh, untuk memahami semua sektor yang dibangun itu harus menjadikan uh, 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 kota sehat sebagai tujuan. Seperti misalnya. Uh, Uh, apa namanya das, uh, PU pekerjaan umum membangun uh, jalan membangun uh, 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 infrastruktur lain maka mereka juga harus berpikir bahwa bagaimana memastikan bahwa infrastruktur yang dibangun itu untuk menuju ke arah uh, Jakarta sehat memastikan bahwa warga punya peluang lebih untuk bisa uh, beraktivitas fisik bisa berjalan dengan aman bisa bersepeda dengan aman itu contoh kemudian bagaimana dengan uh, misalnya dinas uh, taman kota Mereka perlu menyediakan bahwa taman-taman itu bisa dimanfaatkan untuk warga untuk beraktivitas. Pendidikan pun begitu, memastikan bahwa siswa, anak didik juga mendapat pengetahuan lebih bagaimana untuk menjadikan uh, 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 pola hidup sehat. Intinya adalah bahwa kita ingin merubah paradigma dari paradigma yang sifatnya kuratif, pengobatan, menjadi uh, preventif dan promotif. Memastikan warga itu memang ingin hidup sehat. Mindsetnya dirubah bahwa memang uh, 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 menuju ke arah sehat tanpa harus men, uh, membutuhkan perawatan-perawatan lebih dan ini dilakukan secara mainstreaming investasi misalnya di Jakarta kita sekarang sedang menyiapkan PTSP pusat yang menangani izin memastikan bahwa investasi yang diusulkan untuk dibangun di Jakarta juga friendly terhadap urban health system jika investasinya yang yang diusulkan yang sedang dimintakan izin itu mendukung maka dia akan mendapat nilai lebih. Tetapi kalau ternyata tidak atau bahkan merusak lingkungan maka dia akan mendapat nilai uh, minus. Jadi hal-hal seperti itu dilakukan mudah-mudahan dengan uh, dengan perubahan paradigma uh, sehat ini uh, semua komponen masyarakat bisa menjadi menjadi lebih tentunya lebih uh, 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 sehat dan uh, Seperti kita tahu bahwa anggaran yang dibutuhkan untuk kuratif, untuk pengobatan ini luar biasa. Jadi dengan adanya pola hidup sehat, maka saya yakin, saya yakin-yakinnya kebutuhan-kebutuhan itu akan sangat berkurang dan kita tahu bahwa masyarakat miskin yang notabene juga banyak sekali, tinggi sekali angka morbiditasnya, angka kesakitannya, itu juga bisa berkurang. Dengan pola hidup sehat, otomatis juga kemiskinan juga akan bisa berkurang karena kebutuhan anggaran yang digunakan oleh keluarga untuk berubah juga lebih meskipun gratis misalnya karena disediakan di, di, di BPJS tetapi tentunya kebutuhan-kebutuhan lain seperti transportasi dan sebagainya kan ini juga ada jadi mudah-mudahan dengan urban health system yang semakin kuat nanti seluruh warga Jakarta menjadi lebih baik situasinya 
Thank you so much, Ibu Harti, as well as Miss Dan, on emphasizing just the very importance of this mentality shift from curing for health to caring for health, and how being healthy should be the basis on how we change our lives and how we live it, right? Um, so the third question is for Dr. Carl Lofgren. I'm seeing it from our Zoom's Q&A. Uh, I remember that I wanted to ask you about avoiding uh, or managing misinformation as well as hoaxes, but this is very related to Jakarta's case, this question from Asmal Khan Sharif. So let me just read it to you. Dear Dr. Lofgren, the DKI Jakarta province to help uh, is helping fulfilling the basic food needs of its citizen through the KSBB program or the large scale social collaboration program, uh, especially in the food sector or food assistance, right? So the question is, did the New Zealand government do the same thing? Or what did the government do when the lockdown was first implemented last March? So what kind of like basic assistances uh, or kind of like just the very fundamental services that the government help uh, sustain or provide for its people, especially for the first few weeks of the lockdown? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, I think I will start with a second question. I think this your question is quite yes. complex. <laughs> uh, in terms of the food delivery and provisions for 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 the citizens here in New Zealand, yeah. um, so what happened was that all the shops stayed open as normal. Uh, you had to observe social distancing inside the shops, mm. uh, two meters between everyone. Uh, you had to queue to get in, so um, there were not too many people in the shops. Uh, only essential shops uh, were allowed to stay open. Uh, so that was, uh, well, groceries, food, uh, and pharmacies. Uh, there were um, some disputes with certain companies claiming they were actually uh, delivering essential services to the citizens, uh, such as one company um, delivering furniture. Uh, they meant that they were essential. So it, was, it wasn't like clear cut. Um, when we dropped from level four, alert level four to three, uh, most companies were allowed to do um, home delivery. Yeah. So, so it was only a short period where we were actually limited in, in what, what type of food we could access. Uh, there were never any food shortages in New Zealand. Um, of course, people were hoarding, stockpiling once we got the message about uh, a lockdown. Uh, but I mean, that, that was quickly resolved. So there were never any problems. In terms of those people who are vulnerable and couldn't go to the shops themselves, I think many communities organized that themselves. I haven't heard any stories about people who were starving. Uh, somehow people received uh, their deliveries. Right, quest about matching misinformation. <laughs> okay, so, so this is a tricky one. Um, I don't think it has been a huge problem here in New Zealand. I think in terms of government information and in particular our current government's information, so the government has every day, or at least during the lockdown, every day came on television at one o'clock uh, with the Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, and at four o'clock it was uh, the, the Chief Medical Officer from Ministry of Health uh, to, to inform us about the cases. I don't think there have been any real cases of misinformation. Of course, there were rumours on social media, in particular around the, manage, uh, the, um, the quarantine facilities. Uh, there were also cases of people being hanged out as being infected by the virus. Um, but these, I think, they're quite minor uh, with respect in comparison with the government success in actually communicating with the citizens. And I mean, of course, I mean, ICTs or social media platforms played a role here, but it was just as much traditional television. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think the success is really about having a clear message to um, the public. And I think the New Zealand government has really succeeded there. Uh, yes, so actually the first leg of that question on hoaxes or misinformation from one of our audience, um, I think I forgot to mention it to you, is that 
he had once read how in the news that New Zealand's people are only relying on newspapers and some permitted media channels to get an update on COVID-19. So I think, thank you so much for answering uh, the question on misinformation and anticipating hoaxes, which is never straightforward, the answer. <laughs> uh, but is it true that the people of New Zealand tend to rely on just some uh, previously stipulated list of media channels or newspapers that the government kind of endorses? Is, is there like a practice like that in New Zealand? No, no? I, 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 I would say that the New Zealand public is very well read. Yeah. Uh, so we have an, a number of newspapers here. We have a number of television stations. Yeah. We have access to most of, of the global TV networks like Sky News, BBC, CNN, etc., uh, even Fox News. Uh, yeah. I would say that probably 25-30% of the population here are all, also reading British press. So, I mean, the Guardian is huge here. Uh, so, in that sense, I, I wouldn't say that people are misinformed. They're not getting the information. They, they're very well informed. I mean, they right. love to read. <laughs> Yeah, and it would sound like something against democracy if there's only like five or ten lists of media yeah. that are allowed to read. So thank you so much, and I hope uh, to the audience who asked this, it uh, clarifies your, uh, your curiosity. So thank you, Dr. Lofgren. So um, the last question for Ms. Dayan. Um, I think this would be the only question on vaccine. I believe uh, a lot of people here in Indonesia, in Jakarta, are very, very old. They're always curious about the vaccine, and being an uh, being a British yourself, then definitely I would like to ask a qu question about some of the most impactful assistances from the UK government that has allowed academia and the private sector to collaborate together in developing vaccine as fast as it is in the UK. Uh, definitely, what came to my mind my mind would be the Oxford AstraZeneca initiative. Uh, we read it in the news very early from uh, early last year, I think, the second quarter of 2020. So what are the kind of the political or policy and financial ecosystem or climate that the UK government helped establish that allowed or triggered such innovation to happen? Thank you. Yes, we are all very interested in vaccines now. Um, so I think... Um, we have to start before this, this pandemic. There has always been a high interaction between the research community and pharmaceutical research and development units. Um, the companies work with academic uh, scientists at the early stages of investigation and, and design, um, and there is a lot of interaction. That's supported by some of the government research funding. So we have a government uh, program where money is given for early stage research, uh, largely in academia, but sometimes with, with private sector involvement. Um, the government gives the money, but the decisions are taken by an arm's length body. So it's not a political involved decision. There are research councils um, who concentrate on the biological sciences, the physical sciences, the humanities, and, and they are the uh, distributors of, of the research funding. So in terms of this particular interaction, it was a much support, supported in feeling, but a decision between the company and a particular university research facility to join working together. Um, it's not the only one. Uh, Imperial and, and there were other um, operations, some only academic, some purely uh, pharmaceutical private sector and, and some joint. Um, gradually as the first vaccines have successfully come to market, then some of the others have, have stopped either because their results weren't so, uh, so good or because you know, they're, they're crowded out to some extent. Um, in terms of then the UK commitment to a, 
uh, a multilateral support for making vaccines available to everybody because it's a global problem. That, that's a political position, mm. yeah, much supported by many people, but that's, that's, not the, um, that's not a university's decision. AstraZeneca, so the company's own views about whether how it wanted to price its product, again, is a, that's a decision for the company that it has to justify to its shareholders on the basis of where it positions itself. And different companies already in this, you know, even in the first few vaccines have taken a different position. But so for us, you know, the government's absolutely supported the research and, and the, the, the aim and the investigation, but it's not a government uh, uh, vaccine investigation. It was a, a collaboration between a university, an academic institution and a company. Okay. And the justification for which uh, kind of market uh, price that the pharma companies said, so it is not really based on a social um, logic, but it is definitely according to a commercial logic as well, right? Uh, hearing from that. It's both. You know, clearly the company has to, you know, the company wants to survive. It doesn't want to bankrupt itself. It also has a, you know, it, the individuals who run a company and their funders and shareholders have are, are human, have a, have a social conscience themselves. Um, and there's a joining point, we always talk about uh, social responsibility, where the, uh, how a company is perceived is affected by how it positions itself in a market. So it's a joint uh, commercial, you know, even a, even a commercial view cares on the social positioning. So it, 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 it's not one or the other. No, definitely a double bottom line, the commercial as well as yeah. the Thank you so much. So that's it. This, uh, these are all my questions. So for the last, I think, five minutes that we have, I would like to actually hand it over to our home team representative, Ibu okay. Suharti Sutar. I think she would like to ask questions about how Jakarta and New Zealand and the UK can co collaborate better on both the topic of the pandemic and beyond. So before I hand it over to the MC to close, I would give it to you, Ibu yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Bu Dayan and uh, Dr. Lawrence. I would like to invite you uh, to collaborate with us, not only in this uh, COVID, but uh, beyond. Uh, if you like to have kind of co uh, cooperation so on the research uh, with us, we are very welcome. Uh, we invite also uh, universities from other countries uh, to uh, make Jakarta as laboratoriums. Uh, in the education, so we also invite Finnish uh, uh, government to uh, join with us. Uh, Germany, we have already have a Jack Labs in Jakarta to help us in uh, improving our urban regenerations uh, in the in North Jakarta. So uh, uh, we are very keen uh, to uh, to collaborate uh, further with you. And Bu uh, Dayan, you know what? Uh, we learned how to uh, collaborate. Uh, in terms of testing from your universities. That time I called uh, our friends in the in UK and she, uh, Santi Kwan, uh, said that uh, in UK, uh, you collect all the PCRs from universities uh, to be used for the uh, 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 COVID testing. That's what we did. Finally, we called uh, uh, rectors, president of the university in Jakarta to uh, allow uh, the labs to be used uh, uh, by Jakarta to uh, uh, do a better uh, testing. So, lots uh, we learned. And also we learned from, uh, from uh, the uh, New Zealand's how you uh, manage that uh, uh, nicely. Your uh, prime minister is uh, 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 amazing. So. From both country, we run a lot, and we uh, we would like to have uh, better collaborations uh, in the future. Now, uh, particularly uh, the one that I have mentioned earlier on the uh, urban health system, we would like to uh, uh, improve that. And another one is uh, now uh, we have been uh, preparing our uh, so-called hospital uh, revitalizations. We learned from. Uh, 
good uh, hospital in Jakarta, but uh, we would like also, if possible, to run uh, from the hospitals uh, in uh, New Zealand and also in UK. No, no need to go there or your team to go here. We can do uh, like here uh, uh, using a virtual meeting to uh, 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 share uh, the experience of the hospitals, how they improve uh, uh, their qualities of service. Thank you, uh, 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 Ms. Dayans and uh, Dr. Lawrence, and thank you, Baicha, for uh, moderating uh, the uh, seminars. Well, Dr. Lawrence, Ms. Dayan, you have a uh, last parting note or a response to Suharti's call for collaboration, please. Maybe I'll go first, Dr. Lofgren. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope absolutely it will be possible to, to, to continue to collaborate because we do all, all already work a lot with, with Jakarta. Um, health is so much an issue that affects us all, not only uh, the, you know, the health security of pandemics, but, but far beyond that, how we live um, in cities and, and more widely. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This was very, very intriguing. Uh, I think I've learned a lot today. Uh, I'm looking forward to hear more from you and to collaborate with you in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Lofgren, Ms. Zayan, and Ibu Suharti, and to ladies and gentlemen at home. You can see that some of the questions uh, have been answered by Ms. Zayan as well as Dr. Lofgren on the QA, Q a panel in our Zoom chat. So thank you so much. Um, without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Mas Rudi, our MC, to close the session. Thank you very much, Ms. Atricia. And uh, distinguished guests, our audience, ladies and gentlemen, please stand by for our evaluation form. And I'm going to explain in Bahasa Indonesia. Bapak Ibu yang kami hormati, kita akan masuki penilaian uh, kegiatan penyelenggaraan webinar hari ini. Akan nampak di depan layar kaca Bapak Ibu enam pernyataan penilaian kegiatan hari ini dan Bapak Ibu hanya memilih dengan tombol tidak setuju, setuju, atau sangat setuju. Dan kita mulai pernyataan yang pertama. Kualitas visual, gambar, paparan, dan teks sangat baik dan jelas terlihat. Tentukan pilihan Bapak Ibu dimulai dari sekarang. Pernyataan yang kedua. Kualitas audio atau suara sangat jelas dan jernih. Tentukan pilihan Bapak Ibu dimulai dari sekarang. Pernyataan yang ketiga, kualitas materi yang disajikan sesuai dengan tema dan kebutuhan peserta. Tentukan pilihan Bapak Ibu dimulai dari sekarang. Pernyataan yang keempat, Kualitas penyampaian materi oleh narasumber sangat baik dan mudah difahami. Tentukan pilihan Bapak Ibu dimulai dari sekarang. Pernyataan yang kelima, sesi tanya jawab berjalan efektif dan mampu menjawab pertanyaan peserta. Tentukan pilihan Bapak Ibu dimulai dari sekarang. Dan pernyataan yang terakhir, secara keseluruhan penyelenggaraan webinar berjalan efektif dan lancar. Tentukan pilihan Bapak Ibu dimulai dari sekarang. Baik, terima kasih Bapak Ibu untuk penilaian kegiatan hari ini. Dan Bapak Ibu jangan lupa untuk mengisi daftar hadir yang telah diberikan tautannya pada kolom chat oleh tim penyelenggara. Dan... Ya, dan uh, our guest uh, speakers, uh, our guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm afraid that we are at the end of the webinar sessions. And thank you very much for our speakers, Ms. Zoe Dayan, Dr. Carl Lofton, thank you very much for joining in this webinar sessions. And special thanks to uh, British Embassy Jakarta and Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand for supporting this webinar. So thank you very much for your time, and we look forward uh, to meet in another uh, webinar. Stay healthy and stay safe, and don't forget to be happy. Wabillahi taufiq walidaya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Have a great day. Hai Rari. Waalaikumsalam. Sampai jumpa. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bu Harti, terima kasih. Mbak Ica, terima kasih. Mohon maaf, Ibu. Baru sekalinya sekali-kalinya Gak apa-apa. Gak apa-apa. Gak apa-apa, Bu. Great job semuanya, Bu Suarti. Ya, ya, terima kasih Pak Toto. Ini nggak uh, bisa foto bersama ya? Udah selesai itunya? Uh, oh iya, kelupaan. Iya. Panelisnya udah pulang keluar semua, Mang. Yang... Iya, panelisnya kayak panelisnya udah live ya. Oh, Miss Miss Judaya ini masih ada. Judaya. Mbak Ica masih ada nggak, Mbak Ica? Kita bisa keluar. Iya, iya, iya. Kita foto dulu, kita foto dulu. Mbak Ica udah hilang, Mbak Ica. Mbak Ica nya hilang ya. Terima kasih semuanya. Sampai ketemu program yang berikutnya. Insya Allah kita akan rutin uh, dua bulan sekali. Yeah. Sukses, Thank buka you. Maria sukses, keren. Terima kasih buat teman-teman dari BPSDM, Kemendagri, BPSDM seluruh Indonesia. Dari Kemendagri ada Bu Endang, makasih Bu Endang. Terima kasih, sukses semuanya. Ya, yeah, terima kasih. Dari LAN ada Prof Endang juga, Pak Mahdung, dan yang lain-lain semuanya. Terima kasih banyak. PPSDM Regional Bandung juga terima kasih. Bapak Ibu semuanya terima kasih sampai ketemu program berikutnya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Mas Fajar makasih ya Pak. Mas Fajar, Mas Fajar makasih. Sama Ibu. Oh, oh, ini uh, Mas Rudinya sudah uh, dipandu dengan sangat luar biasa. <laughs> one, one step away from MC Kondang Pemprov Bu. Yes, I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Nanti uh, se uh, sebelumnya saya mau kirim 